President, I first of all started off, and of course we all have heard the word from Moscow. So I simply would ask you for your reaction. Are you disappointed that there was no date for the summit set? Or are you so hopeful that you can uh, have one uh, sometime later this year? Well, I hope, of course, it was just a case of uh, they had said they wanted such a thing and uh, agreed to it and be held here in this country, but so far I have not set a date. So uh, I'll, I'll remain hopeful that, that we can have it. I understand there was some progress made, however, in the talks on the intermediate range. Mr. President, uh, do you think that the uh, setback in Moscow helps a cooler period in U.S.-Soviet relations? Or you're very confident you can go on ahead and get, get a common agreement. Uh, I have to believe that there is a, a, an effort being made on their part as well as ours to make the Cold War a little warmer in the right way. <laughs> Let's say less, a little less cold, <laughs> but also a little less war. Mr. President, the, the sticking point of the SDI, uh, are you prepared to make an adjustment in uh, your position in order to achieve uh, an agreement on this occasion? No, I have said from the beginning that this world, which has no defense against nuclear weapons, weapons the only so-called defense is the MAD policy that truly is MAD, mutual assured destruction. And I have spoken to several parliaments throughout the world and legislatures and in each one of them said that I don't believe a nuclear war can be won and it must not be fought. And recently uh, Foreign Minister Shevardnadze here in this room repeated those words to me uh, as being its own belief. It can't be won and shouldn't be fought. So uh, I I cannot make that a bargaining chip. We have the prospect of a defensive system that could practically make nuclear missiles uh, obsolete. And I have said over and over again that if and when we have such a system, we wouldn't use that for our advantage offensively against any other nation. We would make such a system available to the world on the basis that we all then agree to eliminate totally nuclear weapons. You see, we know how, everybody in the world knows how to make them now. So to set out to try and rid the world of nuclear weapons, knowing that someday some madman might come along, as we've had in the past, and make some and try to blackmail the world. But if it's a little bit like when we, after World War I, uh, outlawed the use of gas. We all kept our gas masks. And this is what I think this is, this is like. But I have made it very evident that we would not use this to create some kind of first strike capability for ourselves. We would use it, if anything, to eliminate nuclear weapons. But Mr. President, what is in SDI for Europe? for the protection of Europe. What's that? What is in SDI for the protection of Europe? All right, along with all of this, I have said also over and over again, comes the negotiating a balance on conventional weapons. I think we're all aware, well aware, that the Soviet Union has a conventional weapon balance or superiority over NATO. And I would never, we would never abandon NATO or our allies on this. And so far, nuclear weapons were supposed to balance that imbalance. Well, before we would ever rid ourselves of that, it would also have to include a redressing of the imbalance in nuclear or in uh, conventional mm -hmm. weapons. Mr. President, don't you think that uh, Mr. Gorbachev is trying to take advantage of the fact that you seem to be in trouble with the Congress about SDI and other things, and that you need a summit politically? You're very perceptive. I, 
I have to say, uh, we've, we have felt for a long time that uh, the Soviet Union stays very well informed on uh, our Congress and its doings. And they're well aware that something here that could not take place in their country is the fact that we have a Congress of an opposite political philosophy uh, from the executive branch. And yes, I must say that uh, some of the things that are being proposed in our own Congress uh, sound as if they're sitting on the uh, Soviet side of the negotiating table. Mr. President, how would you explain, especially to a European audience, what has been happening and is happening uh, at Wall Street this week? <laughs> well, they've had a few things happening in their own uh, stock exchanges in the, in, around in the world. I think part, partly it is a long overdue correction. Now what that means in the marketplace is that speculation in stocks and so forth has overpriced the market and there has to be a, a readjustment. But I think the, the size of this was then augmented by uh, some confusion about the fact that we seem to be unable to get together, the Congress again and ourselves, on uh, our uh, budget deficit, which has been growing for a long time. And uh, this is why uh, we, and there were some other things that contributed to it. Uh, there was a concern about the money supply. Well, our Federal Reserve Board has immediately uh, made the money supply more liquid. And uh, at the same time, that had, uh, that had uh, resulted in some increase in interest rates, and our private banks uh, immediately reduced their interest rates. And that's why I think that suddenly the panic subsided and uh, we've had some recovery. And I have, the last I've heard, it's about standing even today in the market. To, well, that's, that's better than <laughs> what it was doing. But um, I, I think the fact that the other day we, we had the biggest single increase uh, in buying that, uh, and in points in the market than of, uh, in, in all our history. Just as we had had the previous days uh, the biggest single decrease in value. But um, as I say, I think this is, and one of the things that I think is, is going to keep it from coming apart is the fact that our economy is as sound or sounder than it has ever been. We have a higher percentage of our population employed than we have ever had in our history. Uh, we have brought inflation down from double digits to where it certainly is easily manageable, interest rates down, and our productivity rate is up. All the indices, the indexes that are used for determining whether you have prosperity or not, all of them are up at a high level. The annual increase in productivity, the increase in purchases by the people, retail purchases, all of these things are at a high level and continuing to increase. So I think with that it would be hard to have this uh, carry us into a depression. It's completely opposite than the great crash of 1929. Incidentally, let me add another thing too that concerns people, and that is with the Congress right now talking a protectionist plan, trade protectionist. Well, I can only tell you that if it comes down to me the way they're talking about it, I will veto it. Because in 1929, the Federal Reserve Board, our government, tightened the money supply after the crash, reduced it, and at the same time then, we adopted a very protectionist tariff plan called the Smoot-Hawley Tariff. Well, those were all the wrong things. We've just gone the other way here, and as I say, maybe they were nervous about those on the Hill who think in terms of protectionist legislation, but I think we can, we can stop that.
I would never support protectionist legislation. Mr. President, you seem to suggest before that um, you felt that perhaps Mr. Gorbachev was taking advantage of your posi the position in Washington at the moment. Do you think in doing that he's endangering world peace? Well, <laughs> I don't. Uh, I don't want to say anything that sounds that threatening. I have to recall that he and I both agreed in our first meeting in Geneva that we had a great, when I say we, our two countries, but he and I personally had a great responsibility as to whether there would be war or peace. And I believe that they want peace as much as we do. I think they would like maybe to win some advantages without war, <laughs> but uh, I think they know it firsthand the high cost of modern war. Aren't you then a little bit disappointed in him personally that he did not come over with a date and tell your Secretary of State today that he will be willing to join you here this year? Well, yes, I'm disappointed. Uh, we had agreed in 1985 in Geneva that there would be two more summits, uh, and one would be in 1986, and I would, they, he would come here. And in 1987, we'd have one in Moscow, and I would go there. Well, it never happened in 18, 1986, and there maybe re were reasons why it couldn't in uh, his having to, uh, to really move into his own government. He had just taken office uh, then in 85, and I, I think that uh, that could be excused, but now it's getting near the end of 87, and uh, he had agreed to come here, and I hope that before the end of the year he'll do so. Mr. President, there are rumors of war in the what? Gulf. There are rumors of war in the Gulf, in the Persian Gulf. We all have uh, uh, our ships there, we Europeans, and not only the United States. Uh, we are very concerned. Some of these decisions have been very controversial, for example, in my country. Uh, aren't you concerned for uh, what could happen in the Gulf? Well, we're always concerned in the Gulf, even just the provocations that they've made so far, the shooting of a missile at a ship and so forth, uh, the laying of mines. But we've had naval forces in the Gulf since 1949. We, just as we have a fleet in the Mediterranean and a fleet in the Caribbean, in all those passageways that are so essential to world commerce, we believe that we all have a responsibility to make sure that international waters remain open to the commerce of the world. And one country, Iran today, seems bent on trying to stop that. And uh, we're not going to let them do it. Now, I think there's a limit as to how far they can go. The very fact that they are engaged in a war with another country, uh, I don't think that they really want to go so far as to find themselves fighting on two fronts and in a, certainly in a, in a war with countries that are far superior to them in power and size and so forth and resources. So we felt that if we didn't retaliate, they would strike again. We know the risk that if, you, if we retaliate, well, then they may feel they have to strike again. But what's the difference? Do you sit here and take it? And how many times do they strike before we decide to do something about it? So we just thought that it was time for a warning to them that any time they get out of line that way, uh, we're going to punish them. Mr. President, regarding Wall Street, some people in Europe blame you and your government for the developments there. What's your reaction on such complaints from Europe about Wall Street? The oh, and it affecting Street. the markets? Well, I think it's an indication of how uh, interrelated we all are now in regard to trade and uh, uh, currency stability and so forth. And so that I don't think, uh, I don't think one can uh, have such a thing happen without it having a world effect. May I follow up? Do you expect the need for a new summit of the seven big countries? Well, not an extra one. We, they're usually held in May or June, and uh, I'm 
sure the next one will be right on schedule. As a matter of fact, we've made great progress in the summit nations uh, with regard to our agreements to negotiate freer trade mm -hmm. uh, between ourselves. We have, as you know, the Uruguay uh, meetings on that and uh, the Louvre agreement on money. That is still in effect and has had a great, I think, a uh, great importance to uh, the stability of exchange in currencies. May I follow up? What do you expect from Europe in the economic field today after Wall Street? What has Europe to do? Well, it's my understanding that they are, their markets have uh, begun to stabilize uh, just as ours has here. The government? What? The government's policy? The governments have to re have to... The government's policy in Europe, what has it? Well, I don't know whether... how much they interfere in the marketplace over there or engage in the marketplace over there, but uh, uh, we haven't had any signs that that uh, the governments of our trading partners have, have panicked in any way. And the uh, we, are, we are continuing to improve on, as I say, the matters of freer and open trade and, uh, uh, and the Louvre Agreement on currency exchange has resulted in a great stability between our countries. Mr. President, Wall Street doesn't seem to have been very impressed by the fact that you are going to cut, trying to cut by $23 billion the deficit. Don't you think it's necessary to go further to, to cut more on the deficit? Well, the going further is a simple case of getting together. Uh, perhaps you're aware, maybe you're not, in our system here, only the Congress can spend money, appropriate the money that's to be spent on various government programs. The president has the right to veto uh, in any disagreement, and they have the right to, if they can, get the required votes to override the veto. But the deficit, which has continued uh, out of line, we have done our best uh, to, in things that we can do at the executive branch, and been very successful in this past year, because we have reduced the 1986 deficit in 1987 by 73 billion dollars. That's about a 30 percent decrease. Well, every year in our system, the president has to send up a budget, what he recommends as the budget. Well, ever since I've been here and having uh, Congress and the other party, uh, they don't pay any attention to the budget I send up. They just go their own way. And uh, that's true this time. But now we have a piece of legislation, which I signed, which they passed, called the graham rudman hollings This is one that was supposed to set a pattern of annual decreases in deficit spending to where down the line we can pick a date and see that we have a balanced budget. We brought the government into a balanced budget. <coughs> They themselves have retreated from that in what the targets are. They've passed legislation here um, as regard to what the targets of, of that Graham Rudman Hollings bill are. We feel that there is an element up there that thinks the only answer must be increased taxes. But I think this is probably true in your own countries as it is in ours. There is a limit beyond which you cannot go in taxing without becoming a drag on the economy. And when your economy decreases in size and wealth, your revenues do. As a matter of fact, I am... I get everybody irritated when I cite a man of many hundreds of years ago, as I understand it, called Ibn Khaldun. I don't know that there were economists in those days. But Ibn Khaldun said, in the beginning of the empire, the rates, the tax rates, were small, but the revenues for the empire were great. At the end of the empire, the rates were great and the revenue was small. Well, we've had that in our own country here. We've seen it happen. And right now, our tax, le our revenues as a percentage of gross national product have remained stable. They're the same percentage every year, but that means there's more money every year because our gross national product has been growing. Well, if the percent of government revenues from taxes remains the same percentage, now it's a percentage of a bigger amount. 
And at the same time, what we've seen is the result of gov Congress's desire to spend. The, sp the spending, government spending, is a much higher percentage of gross national product so that it is increasing above what the revenues are increasing. And our disagreement has been, and why finally, uh, uh, I think we're, we're going to have to sit down together and face each other, it's not the usual legislative process, and try to point out that spending is the cause of our deficit. And until we're willing to do something about spending, it's never going to be corrected. Mr. President, is, is, if I may follow up, um, what seems to create anxiety in the world and in this country is your permanent conflict with the Congress, and neither you, neither the Congress seems to be in a position to win this conflict. Don't you think that there is a fear of paralysis and that something ought to be changed in the system? No, I think our system is right, but uh, there is something that, well, let me try to be very brief with this. Under our democratic system here, every 10 years, because of the changes in population, and you know we're a kind of a mobile society, people move to various parts of the country, the, our Constitution provides that the legislatures of our states will every 10 years reapportion the district lines for congressional districts so that they reflect the change in population growth and so forth. Well, the other party's been in power for quite some time, and the result has been that every 10 years, they have uh, reordered those district lines in order to favor <laughs> the, their ability to elect more congressmen than our party can. And it's named for a man who first brought that about, named Gary, and we call it gerrymandering. And, uh, this is so that they, what has happened in our system, I don't think a founding fathers ever anticipated, was that a thing like this could happen to the place that the people, see I'm the only one, well I'm the vice president, who are elected by all the people. Congressmen are elected by a district. Senators are elected by a state. And here they've elected a number of times Republican presidents where they're not dictated to by those districts. At the same time, they continue to send a majority of the other party. So you have an executive branch with a legislature of another viewpoint, another party. There is one thing, however, that I think has kept the system from uh, too much harm, and that is the presidential veto power. Uh, as long as we have more than a third of the representatives in the Congress, that's all it takes to support a veto. So I've had to a number of occasions and will in the future had to veto, uh, use that power. Then the Congress has to go back to work and usually with the executive branch and find a compromise settlement. Thank you, Mr. Oh. oh, I thought you had another question. Oh, no, no. <laughs> of course we have. We would. Of course we have. You are going to receive a letter from Mr. Gorbachev soon. Do you have any sense what may be in that letter, or are you feeling like writing a letter to him well, over the weekend? Well, I'm, I'm waiting to see. Uh, I just have learned, without any knowledge of what's in the letter, I've just learned that he is sending me a letter. So, uh, now on the other hand, he and his wife very graciously sent flowers to my wife when she was in the hospital, so we're not exactly snarling at each other. Thank you. Thank you. All right. No, I was standing on the stairs. I stood up. Well, didn't tear my necktie, so I guess it's all right. Well, good to see you all. Good to see you. Thank you.